Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Come now, says the Lord to the Israelites, let us reason together, let us sit down and let us talk to one another, let's talk about your problem of sin and let's try to deal with this issue man to man as it were, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be as wool. They shall be as wool. And that word scarlet and that word crimson are taken from the world of dressmaking. It refers to dye, D-Y-E, dye, colour, with which white clothes were dyed to change them into this colour, scarlet or crimson. They were dyed to make them another colour. So it's referring to clothing which has been soaked in dye and the dye is difficult to remove once it's been applied to that garment. Are you with me? Matthew Henry makes the point that human nature is doubly dyed in the world of sin. We're born originally corrupt because we learn to sin. You don't need to learn to sin. We sin from the, from the very beginnings of our life. You have to train a child to do good. You don't have to train it to do bad. You have to train it to say yes but not to say no. You have to train it to obey but not to disobey. We're born with this corrupt nature within us. And then we're died again by actually sinning in life. Some people are dyed by being dipped many times in dye, in the dye of sin. And they are actually dipped and kept in the dye for long periods of time. So varying from person to person, we have all been dyed at least twice and for varying lengths of time in the dye of sin. That's the point that God is making to Israel. We are dyed in sin. Sin has become a part and parcel of our lives to the point that it's not easy to remove it, if at all. But the promise is this, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. In other words, God has got the power to take this dye that's in our lives, this irremovable dye that soap and water can't deal with, that Daz and Purcell can't deal with, that Swarfiger and White Spirit can't deal with, and it's the blood of Jesus Christ. And when you are soaked in the blood of Jesus Christ, that which is deep dyed within you, which is irremovable, which has got power over you, can be broken, its power can be broken, and it can be removed, and you can be made white. Amen. It's the heart of the Christian faith. If we get away from the blood, if we get away from an emphasis on the blood, no matter how subtly that change may happen, then we've got away from dealing with the very heart of the human problem. Might as well stop preaching, shut the church and, and just go home. Close the whole thing down because we're not dealing with the very roots of where the problem is. Jesus died on the cross to provide something, a power which is available from God through Jesus Christ to deal with the very insides of our nature and to make that deep dye crimson white as snow. Do you want to have your dye removed? It's a great promise. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Reinhard Bonnke said these words, There is power and redemption for everyone in the blood of Jesus Christ. True forgiveness is as substantial as the cross on which Christ bought it. None of us can understand forgiveness unless we're taught it by experience. The cross was no fiction. Real blood fell on real ground. And this real blood brings real cleansing to real sinners. For you... And for me, real blood fell on real ground. And this real blood brings real cleansing to real sinners. It's a wonderful, powerful message. 
So what does the blood of Jesus Christ provide? Look in Romans chapter 3 and verse 25. And I've taken this from the King James Version and not from the NIV because the NIV does not translate the word correctly. It translates it as an atoning sacrifice which is good but it's not the correct translation. The correct translation of the word is propitiation. Everybody say propitiation. Propitiation. Whom God, Christ, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. So if you put your faith In the blood of Jesus Christ, then Jesus Christ becomes and is our propitiation. What does propitiation mean? Propitiation is where God is angry at sin. And if you think God can't get angry at sin, then why do you get angry when somebody sins against you? Sin causes anger. Continued and willful sin in particular called and cause anger. God's anger has been taken away because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. When God sees the sacrifice of Jesus Christ dying on that cross, providing his blood to cover our sins, then God sees something which takes away his anger. It covers it and it takes it away. So God is no longer a God who is angry at sin. God, we can experience the love and the grace and the mercy and the compassion of God in our lives. Dad is not mad anymore. Dad is not angry anymore. It's been taken away. I can know daddy's favour and daddy's smile again. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Forgiveness for our sins comes through Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. But forgiveness doesn't simply mean you being forgiven. It means a realization that you have received a release within yourself from sin. God has taken that sin and he has taken it away from you. He's released it from himself so he no longer holds it against us. And it's not an issue anymore. And if you've been forgiven, don't bring the issue up yourself again either. Because God himself has placed it behind his back. Ephesians 1 and verse 7 says, in him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins. Another thing in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. How much more then will the blood of Christ, and follow it through, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. We don't talk very much about guilt these days, and we don't talk very much about people feeling guilty these days. It's almost politically correct not to uh, deal with people in such a way that mentions their guilt or mentions them, makes them feel guilty for anything that they may have done. But that doesn't stop a law court still still declaring somebody to be guilty of something that they have done. Sin brings guilt and it brings feelings of guilt and the one thing that you need to look for to know whether somebody really does feel guilty for what they've done is to look at what their conscience is telling them conscience is working right guilt is declared to yourself by yourself you know that you've done something wrong and this is the very thing that the Hebrew system was unable to deal with it cannot deal with your conscience Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22 says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with blood to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. To cleanse us from a guilty conscience. The blood of Jesus Christ can not only cleanse our hearts from sin, it can cleanse our very consciences so that we no longer feel guilty for things that we've done because we know that Jesus Christ took it for us in our place. So we can approach God, what does it say? With a sincere heart in full assurance of faith and full assurance of acceptance 
by God and we can be released into a life in which we can serve God freely and know that we've been forgiven and cleansed in our conscience. So our conscience no longer accuses us of things that we've done wrong. That's the power of God through Jesus Christ and that's the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. It deals with the internal person. There is no other message in the world like this message. Nothing at all is preached or out there that can deal with the conscience, the guilty conscience of somebody that knows they've done something wrong before God and man. But the blood of Jesus Christ can. Sprinkled on your conscience. Ask him. Ask him to sprinkle your conscience. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when we preach the gospel, we don't put people on a guilt trip. The meaning of the gospel is not to convince people that they really are guilty sinners. The point of mentioning sin and the point of mentioning guilt is to tell people it's been dealt with. It's been dealt with. So you move on from feelings of guilt into feelings of full assurance of acceptance by God because you're no longer guilty before God because Jesus Christ took it for you. And the reason that it's so real is because it's subjective to your experience and you can actually be released from it. No accusing voice anymore because you know the grace and the acceptance of God.